glad to see you here to worship with us this morning. We welcome you here. And uh, I know that the ladies are having a great time. If you've looked at any Facebook or anything like that, I haven't because I don't do Facebook. But They're having an awesome time. They're having an awesome want, time. Yeah, I see one picture. Um, but jealous. I was down there doing some other stuff for the camp and uh, doing their hay field for them and got a chance just uh, for maybe about... 40 seconds to speak to my wife and she said they were having a great time. <laughs> oh, okay. Good to see you. <laughs> Have a good day. Okay. You know, sorry. Yeah, just blow me off and take right off running again. You know? <laughs> but anyway, they're having a they're having a good time. They should be home. They should be actually about ready to head on their way home, and so they should be home right after we get done. Um, but we're glad that you're here to worship with us. And uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, today. Today, starting at 4 o'clock, will be the viewing and then the memorial service for Kathy Meadows. Um, and uh, then a meal right afterwards. And so I encourage you to come and uh, give your condolences to the family and also uh, celebrate the life of uh, Kathy Meadows. Then also, for some, um, there's not too many here. This morning, um, <clears throat> Kathy and and also uh, Jerry and Alice would know. Um, but if you've been here for a long time, um, <clears throat> then you'll remember Gert Norris. Gert used to always sit right over here and play the piano, and Charlene would play the keyboard, and they would play. Um, Gert had played the piano ever since I came. She was playing the piano. And uh, anyway, Gert Norris passed away, um, and the memorial service funeral for her, well actually she was in Florida with the kids living near the kids down there, but the <clears throat> memorial service and funeral will be at Norton Eastman in Wellington on uh, <clears throat> the 9th, which is next Saturday, uh, the 9th at 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, viewing 11 o'clock. I'm thinking 11 o'clock service, I might be wrong, maybe 10 o'clock service. Um, but that will be next Saturday, and I will be doing the, the funeral for them, the service for them. But again, another <clears throat> opportunity to be able to celebrate, and to be able to celebrate the fact that God has given us life, and that when we do pass from this life, it's a celebration. Amen. And so important to keep that in perspective. Also continue to pray for the family, the Burke family, and those related around him uh, as we had the service uh, for him this past week as well. I think that, oh, there is a, a flyer on the back table for the teens. If you are interested, teens, or interested in getting some of your other teens to go to it, um, we do have a retreat at Skyview. Uh, ranch coming up in November, but you need to make sure that you get the money to us by the end of this month, the 29th. So if you're planning on going, you need to get those forms filled out. Uh, there's also another form that's not included in the form that you have as part of that registration, and that is a specific form for Skyview. The one that you have is one that is done for um, the Hebron Association, but there'll be another form that I'll give you teens if you're interested. Uh, to participate in it as well. I think that that is all in the way of announcements. Um, so let's uh, begin our worship time together. Let's stand together and begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning and thank you, praise you for your goodness to us. Father, I pray that you would be with those families who are grieving the loss of those that they have loved and cared for over the years. Lord, we pray that you would especially be with those of the Meadows family and the Bird family and the Norris family. Lord, I pray that you would comfort their hearts. We thank you, Father, that there is great opportunity to celebrate when we have had the privilege to know you as our Lord and Savior. We just pray that you would uh, be with us today as we look into your word. Fill us with a knowledge of your will and spiritual understanding. We pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our thoughts and direct our thoughts, that we might be more conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us, for 
what you have provided for us. And I thank you most of all for eternal life. But we thank you also, Father, for the fact that you have given the Holy Spirit, that he is with us, he is in us, and that he guides and directs our thoughts and, and helps us to make the right life choices. Father, we pray that you would help each of us to surrender our hearts to you. Thank you for being our creator and sustainer in all of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Abby is down there leading the ladies' worship, so once again, you are with me, okay? Our God reigns. Let's sing this together.
chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, although he wasn't there on the night in which Jesus Christ actually took bread and broke it and said, eat ye all of it, or took the cup and gave it to each one, reminding them it was symbolic of his blood that would be shed for them. But the Apostle Paul, writing later, says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so we encourage you, if you have become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your eternal destiny, then we remember that we share together. Once a month, we share together that it was His body that was beaten for us. I mean, beaten beyond recognition for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Remember, the Bible reminds us, by His stripes, we are healed. Eat ye all. That's good. It says that after supper he took the cup and he also took it and reminded them that it would be his blood that would be shed for them. So he took the fruit of the vine, the wine, and he gave it to them and they each passed it around and drank it so that they would remember that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. They would be reminded of that, even going back into the Old Testament, they're reminded of the fact that the animal was slain, that they had to bring that sacrifice. And so because of it, it is because His blood was shed for us that we have forgiveness of sins. Drink ye all of it. As we stand to be able to once again sing, going to have a couple of people walk around with a garbage can to be able to collect those uh, cups. So let's all stand together and once again celebrate. Remember, it is a celebration that we have when we think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a celebration of how great He is and His great salvation, but it's also a celebration of how much He loves us. that will take us on a journey for quite a long time. We're going to go through the entire Old Testament on Sunday mornings. We're not going to go verse by verse because to do that would take us an exceedingly long amount of time. 
but we will make sure that we cover the major points of the Old Testament. And as soon as I mention that, I think back to what I have heard from many individuals. People often ask me, why should I read the Old Testament? You'd be amazed how many people I have that will come to me and say, why should I read the Old Testament or why should I study the Old Testament anyway? Isn't it really all about Jesus Christ? Isn't it about the fact that in the New Testament is where we are today and we are not under the law and so because of that, why should I study all of that? Well, this is just the tip of the iceberg of reasons why. But I couldn't think of a better reason why than the first one. God said he inspired it. Okay? God said he inspired it and it's beneficial for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it clearly says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Get this. All Scripture is what? Profitable. For teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. If you are only going to take pieces and parts, you're going to miss the big picture, and neither are you going to be adequately knowledgeable and adequately equipped for every good work. God's Word, the whole of it, is inspired. Now, maybe you have always felt, because you have a Bible that has red letter edition, that those are the words that are most inspired. No. Those are the words that Jesus spoke, as we understand it, but that doesn't mean they're more inspired than the rest of the Word of God. All of the Word of God is inspired. What do I mean by that? The word inspired means God breathed. It means that it literally comes forth from God that the Holy Spirit spoke to holy men of God, Peter tells us, as they were born along by Him. So that the Holy Spirit works specifically in individuals, 40 of them all together, as they wrote and penned the Word of God for us. So you've got 66 books 40 individuals writing who are inspired by God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit bore them along so that they would write exactly what God wanted us to know. We have the completed text. We don't need anything else. We have everything we need to know in the Word of God. Secondly, a study of the Old Testament will strengthen our faith. As you go back and you study, now you say, well, what about those passages where you read for maybe a chapter or two of names of people? Well, you recognize that it was very important for the Jewish people to understand where they came from, their identity, what tribe they were part of, specific regulations and rules for different groups, and where they lived. It was brought about. So important to understand that even those have great significance. You say, well, I don't understand it. Well, we're going to work through some of that. We'll, we'll walk through it. But as you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, it reminds us, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, men of old gained approval. So, if I'm wanting to know, how do I come into relationship with God? How is it that I am going to be able to have God's approval in my life, well, first of all, it's by faith. By faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. We've just gone through it repeatedly in 1 John. You have to believe who Jesus Christ is. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God. You have to understand it. They understood that. Going all the way back, they understood that God was the Creator. That has come under significant attack in our world. It has been under significant attack for years now. And so we have to go back there and start there even today. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. They understood that. As I look at their lives and understand, therefore, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, because I look at this great cloud of witnesses, I look at all of these people, starting with like an Abel, or looking at Enoch, or Noah, or 
these different individuals were great individuals of faith in the Old Testament, and I see how God worked with them, it also will affect my faith that I can trust, that I've got a big God. And because I have a big God, I can trust Him with the details of my life, no matter how big they are. He brought everything into existence. I can trust Him. But we also are reminded that as I look at those individuals and how they followed after God, what a testament it is for me to say, I need to lay aside the sin and the, the weight that so easily encumbers me, so easily ensnares me, and I need to run with patience the race that is set before me. Now listen, we all have a race. Your race is not my race. My race is not your race. But we all have a race. How we run it is important to understand that by faith, we can run that race and by faith, we keep our eyes fixed on the finish line. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So when I study the Old Testament, it helps strengthen my faith. It helps me to see what God has been up to from the very beginning and that I can trust Him. He is working everything according to His plan. When you think we are... We have this memorial of witnesses. Let's live sold out for Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12. Not only that, you know, some people learn by just simple instruction. You give them certain truth, and they say, that's what I'm going to do. Some people learn best when they see what happens when somebody else doesn't do it right, or someone does do it right, then they learn best, that's how I should do it or not do it. So, when you study the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians reminds us that it curbs our craving for worldly desires. Because the way that they craved in the Old Testament, the Israelites and what they did helps me to understand, don't do it like that. Don't go there. Here are some people who already went there. See how it worked for them. That's why it's always best not to be the oldest in your family. <laughs> okay? Because when you're not the oldest in your family, you've got lots of track record you can watch. Okay? And say, yep, that didn't work too well. Okay? Not going there. Well, I mean, you can be really hard-headed and say, nope, I'm doing it anyway. Well, see how that works for you, because some people only learn through the school of hard knocks. But the reality is that's not the best way to learn, because sometimes consequences come that you can't reverse. So it's best to be able to recognize and learn. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Is through. I don't have all of the verses because I didn't want to utilize all that time. Now these things happened as examples for us. What's he talking about? Old Testament. You read the whole text. He's talking about the Old Testament. So that you would not crave evil things as they also craved. Don't be, here's, a, here's just a few of the things. Don't be idolaters. Okay, right up front. We need to say, I don't want to be an idolater. Why? Because I go back, I look at the Old Testament, we see where they did idolatry, and we see how it worked for them. Not real well. Okay? <clears throat> Nor act immorally. We go to the Old Testament, we see how they acted immorally, and we see the consequence. 23,000 fell in one day. Not good. Okay? <clears throat> or try the Lord. Don't put the Lord to the test. Don't say, Lord, you've got to do this because I'm doing... No, don't put God to the test. You do that, it won't go well for you. Nor grumble. They began to grumble, and because they began to grumble, God had to take measures to help them to understand they need to be thankful. So, when you look at it, it curbs our craving for worldly desires. When we go back and we study the Old Testament, it will help us to see what we ought to do. Again, it reminds us in verse 12, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. 
upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. If you think <clears throat> that you can avoid this truth, you're sadly mistaken. God has given us the Old Testament so that we can learn how God acts in relation to sin. And if you think that you can sin and you can just live any way you want and there's no consequence, <clears throat> God says, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not what? Fall. There will be consequence. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he also shall reap. That's New Testament, okay? That's not just back there somewhere. We need to recognize why God has given us his word. But also, it reminds us who the creator is and who's in control. When you and I think and we look at our world, and our world is in chaos, and our world seems like it's, it's going astray faster than ever, we need to remember God has not wound it up like a clock and just set it on the shelf and allowed it to tick. God still is actively in control and God is still working all things according to His divine purpose. And one day, He is going to return. One day, He is going to set up His kingdom. One day, He is going to rule, as it says in Psalm chapter 2, with a rod of iron. One day, there will be ultimate end where Satan, his angels, and all those who have ever rebelled against God and have not believed in His Word, will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. That's a fact. But you know how we learn to trust and learn to recognize? We go back to the Old Testament and we can watch God's track record. What God prophesies, and this I didn't put in here, but it would be a big one. What God prophesies will always come to pass. You could just simply take Jesus Christ as a simple illustration of that. All of the prophecies, we would never know all of those truths about Jesus Christ if we did not have the Old Testament and we did not go back and look at it and understand that when God makes a statement, it comes to pass not 20% of the time or 50% of the time. He's not Nostradamus, okay? It comes to pass 100% of the time. When he makes a statement, you can mark it down. It is going to happen. Why? Because he is the creator and he is the sovereign ruler over all creation. You go back and you look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, it sets it forward there, doesn't it? The greatest king, maybe one of the greatest ever, when you look at what he had, the land mass and everything, just a great king. And yet he walked out on his rooftop and said, my, look at what I have made. And God takes it from him that instant. And he's out in the field eating like an animal. Why? Because God had told him a year earlier, this is what will happen if you don't acknowledge that I alone rule and reign over the affairs of mankind. And because of it, Nebuchadnezzar had to come to the place where after seven years he finally acknowledged God is the only one who uh, rules and reigns over the affairs of mankind. We can learn so much by going back and looking at the Old Testament about who God is. The fact that He is in control. When you read in Isaiah 45, I just used that one, Woe to the one who quarrels with his Maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, What are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, He has no hands. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, and I ordained all their hosts. God is the sovereign creator of all the universe. 
And so we need to go back and we need to start at the beginning. And we need to say, God, teach me who you are. God, help me to know you more. Help increase my faith because I can see your track record and how you have worked historically down through the years. We start back in the book of Genesis. We start in Genesis because that's where it all starts. It's the book of beginnings. The word Genesis, go back to the book of Genesis with me. Go to Genesis chapter 1. As we begin this journey, we recognize that Genesis, in its original title of the book of Genesis, simply means origin. It was written around 1450, 410, somewhere in there, B.C. We don't know the exact day, but we know it's in this time frame. Number one, we know it because, and you'll see here on the slide in a minute, that it's before the death of Moses because Moses writes the first five books. He writes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then Moses dies. Now, we know that at the very end, probably Joshua helped in some of the concluding remarks because Moses did die. But as you look at the fact that it's written at that period of time, and these events are happening way before that. So we know the reason that he knows what to write is, again, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He also would have had some information that would have been passed down from one generation to the next. But to make sure it's perfectly correct, it is because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, as you think of this writing, the original title means origins or beginning. That's what it means. And written by Moses, as I've already stated, think of how important this book would be to those Israelites that are getting ready to go into the promised land. Those Israelites are getting ready to enter into the promised land. As they're getting ready to enter into the promised land, they need to know who they are. They need to know, <clears throat> why can we trust God? The one who has brought us this far. Oh, remember that some of them have not known some of the past. Remember, 20 years old and, and older have all died. So you've got children who have either been born or grown up in the wilderness experience of 40 years. And now God is going to give them a writing that helps them to understand this is the absolute truth of where you came from. And we're going to see the significance of some of the terms that he uses, even on how he addresses who he is, right in the very first and second chapters. As you look, you see that it's foundational to all the other books of the Bible. This is foundation. Everything else is built on it. If you don't have Genesis, if you don't have, in the beginning God created... If you don't believe that statement, if you believe that we're here because of some evolutionary process, and you don't believe that God is a creator, then neither will you be able to accept everything else that the text says. You have to start with, He is the creator. It was written just before the death of Moses as the Israelites were about to enter into the promised land. So let's look at the passage. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. And it says, beginning in verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. I like when it talks about created here. That is the word bara, to call into existence out of nothing. God actually called into existence out of nothing. This is not the beginning of God. This is the beginning of time and history as we understand it. As you look here, it says it was formless. The idea is this, that the basic elements, rather than the completed system, is how Henry Morris, the great writer on the book of Genesis, brings us forward. He brings it forward that the basic elements are all there now. 
Out of nothing, God brought all the basic elements needed for everything else that is going to happen. Then it goes on to give a description on each day of what happens. Here's how it goes. Day one, space, mass, and time. Look at what it says in verse 3 down through verse 5. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is not the sun. You're going to see that that's going to come later. Remember, God can create light because He is who? God, okay? He doesn't need to have the sun to have light. Notice it says, God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness He called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. So now we have a distinction that begins with time. So now we've got space, we've got mass, we've got time. God calls it night, the light day, darkness He called night, and there was evening and morning one day. And let me just say right up front, that each of these, and I'm not going to get into a, a lot of apologetics on this. We could take the whole time talking about one phrase, and that is the word day, yam in the Hebrew. You want to talk to me about it sometime? Be happy to do that. But that word literally is a 24 hour period now. There's one day, evening and morning, where one what? Day. God constituted and said, from now on, here's how it's going to be. Every time you have evening and morning, you're going to have what? One day. That's how it's going to go. Day two, you look at verse six. In verse six, you see it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. So here you have, remember, you got this water. It says, In the midst of the uh, waters, let there be a separate, the, separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below and the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. So what God did, there is a separation of water, upper water, that's what we think of typically as our atmosphere, okay, and the waters that were on the below, there's a space now in between, okay. What it is believed is that when he did this, you have the earth's hydrosphere and atmosphere. So you've got water that's going to be covering the earth. You have the atmosphere. And it is believed that there was a canopy. <coughs> that this canopy is what probably also attributed to longevity because you no longer had the harmful rays ultimately from the sun that you're going to see eventually because of this canopy, also probably attributes to the amount of water that came with the flood because of that as well. You're going to see that there was not the normal rain as we think of it here in a few minutes. He says in verse 8, God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Now when he calls the expanse heaven, that is not where God dwells. That is, remember, when you think of heaven, you're thinking of that expanse that is above the earth. That's the first heaven. Then the second heaven is where the stars and sun and moon are going to be. Okay? What we consider outer space. Okay? That's when you're thinking of this. You'll see how this works out in just a moment. And so that's day two. Day two is the earth's hydrosphere and the atmosphere. Then you have day three. On day three, you have the earth's geosphere and biosphere. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. So now we have what? Earth appearing. We've got the waters being gathered together. God called the dry land earth and gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. That's the first time that God says he saw that it was good here on day three. So you've got the waters, you've got the land mass. This is all now, God says, here's where the seas are. Remember, the rest of the Word of God reminds us that God is the one who set the boundaries for the oceans. He is the one that determined where they would be. This is part of His creative act. In verse 11 it says, Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind and seed in them. And it was so. You say, well, how in the world do we have all of the reproduction of the plants? And all? Because God what? 
God said it'll have seed in it. And the seeds, even when you eat seedless watermelon, they're not seedless watermelon. The seeds are just really, really small. Okay? There's still a seed in there or you wouldn't have another seedless watermelon. Okay? Just in the way of information for you. Okay? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a pain. But, hey, if you go to a picnic and you don't have a watermelon with seeds in it, who's going to be spitting them at each other? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, we have COVID now. Don't do that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but it was always a lot of fun. <clears throat> anyway, the fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind and seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, a third day. Now, isn't it amazing that when you go out... <clears throat> and you plant a soybean seed, you expect that corn comes up, right? No. Because God made every seed after its own kind. A soybean seed is a soybean seed is a soybean seed, and definitely a soybean seed, no matter what you do to it genetically, you can make it do a lot of different things, but it's always going to be a... Exactly. Okay? But so it is true with human beings, too. You're going to see that in a moment. We didn't go fish, fish with gill glitz, you know, slits in it, so now it can breathe, and then, oh, look at that. Legs on this. Now it walks out on dry land. Now it can breathe air. Now all of a sudden, it's going to go from there to who knows what, and from there to an orangutan, and from an orangutan to a person. God made everything, don't miss this, after their kind. He's the creator. He can do that. You say, well, why did he do it that way? Take it up with him someday. Okay, he's the one that did it. Who am I, the clay, to say to the potter, why did you do it like that? Okay. We just accept that's how he did it. It was evening, it was morning, a third day. Notice verse 14. Here we go into the fourth day. Day four is the astrosphere. So here we have the Lord God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. Everybody understands where we're at right now, right? Sun and what? Thank you. And also the stars. Here back just a few days ago, it was a perfectly clear night. The moon was, <clears throat> was bright as could be, and the stars were as bright as could be, and you could walk outside and you didn't even need a flashlight. It was that bright. That is the light that God has given to govern the night. And the bright light, we've had some great days of bright light that you can't deny the sun is extremely bright. The other day I was coming back from Skyview and I was so amazed at how the clouds were just right and the sun was shining through. It looked like the rapture could happen at that moment, <laughs> okay? And I was like, oh Lord, even so, come quickly. What an amazing sight. What a beautiful, I even took my don't do this at home, okay? You know, one of those do, kids, if you're listening, on, do not do this, okay? You take your phone out as you're driving, okay? <clears throat> and snap a picture. Don't do that, okay? I couldn't help myself. There wasn't enough room to pull off that road. You pull off that road, you're in a ditch and you're going to be staying there, okay? So, I mean, but it was amazing sight. But guess who made it? The very one who created all of it, who loves us so intensely that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. Ah, oh, he's the creator of all of it. And you look at all that he has done, all of the stars and the moon and the sun and all that goes with it. I'm not going to get into all of what it means when it says here, for signs, for seasons, for days and years. We understand how that plays out, especially as far as years, 
okay? But he reminds them that it was God who placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Verse 20, <clears throat> day five. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. This is the fish and fowl movement, okay? This is when God created everything that flies or swims. Amazing. Even the biggest and greatest of the sea monsters that have ever been. People say, were there dinosaurs? There were great sea monsters. And we'll see that there were also dinosaurs. Because that comes up next. As you look at the formation of life here, to live in the atmosphere, to live in the hydrosphere, to live in all of that that God has created. He has made it possible for him. And I just think of some of the greatest things he's made to, to swim and some of the things that we eat. I mean, nothing like a good walleye dinner, huh? Or a good perch dinner, okay? Amazing food that God has given. Now, just a little note here. We'll see in a moment that that wasn't from the beginning, that it was for food. Ooh, yeah, no. At first, it's simply vegetation. We'll see that. Notice it goes on. And he reminds us that God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. So that, here's another little thing that helps us to understand. A perch is a perch is a perch. A perch never becomes something other than a perch. A wild turkey is a wild turkey. Oh, that's great, you know. So wonderful, okay? I'm glad they don't change into a pigeon, okay? It never happens, okay? Exactly. It would take way too many of them to make a good meal, okay? But as you look at it, it's after their kind that they are to be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters of the sea, let the birds multiply on the earth. Day six, formation of life for the geosphere and the biosphere. So now we're going to move to the land animals. From dog to dinosaur and even man is going to be here on day six. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind. You get where you go. You constantly hear this phrase, after their what? After their kind. He says, and everything that creeps on the ground after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Plant life is there. Animals are there now. But there's one thing still missing, and that is man. But on day six... He is going to create, in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let me just stop right there. When God created plant life, what makes us distinct from everything else in plant life, there is no conscious life. In animals, there is conscious life. In other words, there is an animal and he's conscious of his surroundings and environment and all of that. But in man, 
I use that man and woman, okay? We are the only part of God's creation that has self-awareness, self-consciousness. The fact that we are created in the image of God means that we have this self-awareness, this self-consciousness, and we understand and we're able to be in relationship with God in a way that nothing else of His created world is able to relate to Him at. That we have intellect, will, emotion, rational thinking, all of that that goes with that. But most importantly, that we can relate with Him. We can come, as we're going to see here in a moment, that there's the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, they could eat of all of the plant life and all of the food that is there for them. And they could enjoy it and they could be thankful and say, Oh God, I praise You for what You have done. Oh God, thank You for what You give me. Thank You for life. Thank You for help. Thank You for everything that You bless me with. That is distinct to mankind. As you look, you see that He made and created, and this is where our purpose and meaning come from. You don't need somebody to tell you how great you are to have purpose and meaning. You don't need someone to affirm you. You have the Creator of all the universe who said, I have made you in My image. I have made you so you can relate to Me. You don't need more self-esteem. You just need to relate to the Creator of all the universe. Draw near to Him. He'll draw near to you. That is a truth that God has given us so that we today can know for certain that God exists. He has put it within us. Part of God creating us in His image is that He has created us with a knowledge. He has created us with an understanding of who He is and His greatness and His glory. Now listen, we're going to see next week it's been marred. But it no less diminishes the fact that we are created in His image in such an amazing way. As you look, He gave then, He says, I want you to rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth. So He was given then, He, was given, he gave man a stewardship responsibility. And again, we have come to the place today where we recognize that because of sin, because of the fall, that ultimately even that authority has been diminished. But one day, it's going to be restored. One day, you'll be able to pet a lion without fear of being bitten. Now listen, today, I wouldn't recommend it. Even those, even those who thought they could. I know some of you are going to say right away, Siegfried or Roy, okay? You know this, okay? You think you can control them, but at any moment, what? You cannot have authority over them at any moment. Oh, you can train them, but they still can rebel. Well, they got bit yeah, they got killed. <laughs> One. Ultimately, as you look at the fact that we are to subdue and rule over it. We're to rule as God's representative. And notice that initially, you don't even have a fear of man between man and the animals. He's just going to rule over them. We're going to see that He ultimately is going to name them. But look at what it says in verse 29. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. In other words, Adam and Eve were vegetarians. They ate only plant life. But guess what? So were the lions and all the rest of them. Look at what verse 30 says. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given 
every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So as you look at this, six days, what an amazing God that can create everything that you and I see, the trees, the landmass, the seas, the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, everything. What an amazing God that can create all of that in six days. And the pinnacle of that creation is us. And he says, you're made in my image so that we can relate to each other. So that we can share and talk with and be in fellowship with each other. You're going to see that as we look further in the book of Genesis. How that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Could you imagine just being able to walk along, just talking to God, and God is here with you, and that God is there. You can feel His presence with you in a way that has never been felt. But now we have the Spirit of God who lives within us that we can walk with and talk with God. As you look at the amazing, now he comes, it doesn't stop there, verse 1 of chapter 2, as we wrap up this creation week, it says, Thus the heavens and all the earth were completed, all done, and all their hosts. So this is everything. Everything that was going to be created ultimately happens when? In those six days. Everything is done, everything is completed. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Now, when it says here on the seventh day that he rested, that does, that does not mean that he had to sit down and, whew, I'm just so tired out. No. Everything was complete. The word rested means to cease or subsist from doing, to stop doing it. It's the word that we get in the Hebrew, Sabbath. The idea of Sabbath is rest. It's never about, never has been about, and never will be about, if I'm keeping the exact term, it's always about rest. God established this. In the book of Exodus, we learn that the reason that God did this is because he also wants us to what? Rest. He wants us to have a day of rest. And so specific was this day of rest to the Israelite that God said if you violate this day of rest, it's going to come with stern consequence. I want you to keep this day of rest. And he goes back and Moses in writing Exodus goes back to the creation account and reminds us it was literally a seven-day event here where six days creation happened, seventh day God rested, we work six days, and seven days we rest. Listen, the five-day work, work week, that's something that's been made up by man, okay? Now, I know you're all enjoying it. You all like to see a four-day work week, okay? But the reality is God said six days you work, and then you what? Rest. Then you rest. We need that. God's the one who made us. He knows how we are. And he made us in his image so that we could relate with him, worship him, fellowship with him, and ultimately reproduce so that the earth would be full of people who could relate to God, worship God, fellowship with God. What an amazing God we have. Amen. He created all of this. And we're reminded even in the New Testament that he has given us all things freely to enjoy. He created this for us so we could enjoy it. But don't lose sight of who the creator is. Don't lose sight of who's in control. Make sure that we give him the right place because there is no one else who can compete with him. There is no one else and there is nothing else in our life that should be vying for our worship, our attention, our allegiance, our love. Why? Because He alone is the one who is worthy of that. 
In Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created, sets the stage for everything else he is going to say in the rest of the Word of God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our creator. We thank you and we exalt your holy name because you alone are worthy of our adoration and praise. Father, may your Holy Spirit work in our hearts today. Help us to celebrate your greatness. We thank you that you are working all things according to your plan, your will. And Father, we long for the day when we will be able to see our Savior face to face and we'll be able to see your glory there in heaven. And Father, we pray that that day would come soon. We thank you again for all that you bless us with. Help us to remain faithful until you return. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. I